Hi everyone, FIDE Master Dennis Monacruz is here, and this is part four of the series on the Quick Ray Lopez, part three on the Schliemann, or the Anish if you prefer, and this will be the uh, the end of the Schliemann episodes. Okay, so here's the Ray Lopez, there's the Schliemann, or the Anish if you prefer, and in the first part we discussed uh, basically everything but knight to c3. In part two, we started on knight c3, and after fe4, knight e4, focused on d5 here, which we're not going to cover now. And uh, this time we're going to cover knight f6. And we did discuss one knight f6 line last time, and that went queen e2, d5, and now knight to g3. So it's it's a line with some importance, but um, it's not really one of the absolute main lines. So those would be knight takes f6 check here, and um, sorry, and the immediate knight takes f6. So knight f6 right away, and queen e2, d5, and then knight takes f6. All right, well, let's start with queen e2. We'll do this one first. d5, knight f6, and here you take with the pawn. Okay, very important. Not with the queen. If you take with the queen, white just takes on e5 and is doing well. Um, after knight f6 right away, here you do take with the queen. You don't take with the pawn. If you take with the pawn, then the king side becomes a bit um, fragmented. And I think white just plays knight h4 there, and... Um, Black is a bit unhappy. Maybe even just d4. Actually, d4 might might be straightforward and good. So here you play queen f6. All right. Anyway, back to the queen e2 line. So queen e2, d5, knight f6, and here you do play g takes f6. All right. Now, the first thing to note is that knight takes e5 is just junk. This is just a blunder because after f e5, queen e5 check, simply queen e7, and white's compensation for the pieces insufficient. And of course, he's not picking up the rook in the corner because of the pin. So the move here is d4. And now black should avoid something like e4. Uh, after e4, knight to h4 is, I think, pretty effective. So you play bishop to g7. And black is willing to uh, to sacrifice the, uh, the pawn here. d takes e5, castles. All right, and now we've got a, uh, a major parting of the ways. I should say, first of all, that e takes f6 is is not really so great. After queen takes f6, black has a very natural plan of uh, development. So we'll put the bishop on g4, put the rook on e8, and um, white's going to have a, a, a very tough time really finding a, a secure position. This is definitely worth the pawn for black. I mean, if white castles kingside, you can see he's castling into it over there, but it's pretty tough to castle queenside. And, um, yeah, th this would not really be uh, a pawn grab that I would recommend for white at all. Similarly, if, um, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, if bishop takes c6, bc, again, e takes f6, queen f6, gives black uh, too much counterplay. Plenty of compensation. So these are both um, dubious approaches for, for white. Okay, so going back here, the two key moves are bishop takes c6, and then after bc to play e6, or to play e6 straight away. But these lead in very di different directions, because after the immediate e6, black um, can play knight to e5 and avoid the, the exchange. All right, now there are some slightly tactical lines that you, you want to memorize, but if you once you've got them down, uh, you're in good shape. And really, even if you don't have these memorized, I think you can generally figure out what you're doing. Okay, so white's got... Uh, several possibilities here. Castles, bishop to e3, and bishop to f4. And bishop to f4 is the most dangerous of the options. All right, if castles, then just bishop takes e6. Okay, uh, on knight to d4, you're going to play bishop to g4, which we'll come back to in a moment. If white plays h3, then you probably want to play bishop to f7. Gets the uh, bishop off of its exposed position on the e-file. Might come to h5. More likely, it'll come to g6. But basically, the, the key thing is just to get out of the way of the uh, the e file. Okay, so knight to d4, and here's a little trick that we're going to see a few times. You throw in bishop to g4 to induce f3, and then you drop the bishop back out of the way. You could probably go to d7 as well, but bishop c8 is better. And after f4, again, a little tactical trick, c6. Now, if uh, white saves the bishop with bishop to a4, then you play queen to b6. And in fact, I've, I've had this in my own games. It's perfectly fine for black. c3, bishop to g4. No troubles at all. Black is absolutely equal here. 
Okay, if f takes e5, then f e5 takes, takes, and black is, of course, regaining the piece. Uh, after bishop to d3, maybe you could take on d4, but then the white bishops kind of come into their own. So the best is e4. And this was played in a game, Polgar Rajabov, and actually some other games too. Uh, the year before the Polgar Rajabov game, which was in 2008, there was a game between Steinitz and Koffler, and the games were identical. Takes, takes on d4 check. Bishop e3, takes, takes, takes. And now, hey, black's up a piece, but white gives perpetual like this. Okay, Polgar and Rajabov stopped here. The earlier game showed greater fighting spirit. <laughs> white played queen to d8 check, and then they agreed to the draw. So this is perfectly okay for, for black here. All right, um, instead of castles, again, bishop to e3 is a possibility. c6, once again, bishop to d3, bishop e6. And here, white has a couple of tries. You can either castle kingside or go for knight to d4. Uh, again, knight to d4 is met by what will soon be old faithful, bishop to g4. And then the bishop drops back to d7. Black is doing just fine here. If white castles, then queen c8 is a pretty good move. Okay, and now if um, we have this exchange, then this is nothing. Black plays e4, kills the diagonal, and uh, no problems at all. If knight to d4, okay, we drop back. Yeah, no bishop to g4 this time. Queen h5, knight to d3, rook takes d3. Yeah, if c takes d3, then you have bishop to g4, which shows why on this occasion we didn't want to flick in bishop to g4 first. So rook to d3, bishop to e8, and then the bishop's coming to g6 with equality. For instance, queen f5 takes, and um, maybe rook f takes is slightly more accurate. So that way the uh, a7 pawn is protected, and there's no fork with knight to e6. So anyway, this is just equal. White has nothing here. So going back, bishop to e3 is really nothing special. Castles is better than bishop to e3, I think, but neither supplies any real chances for white. The most dangerous line, I think, is bishop to f4. And now, here, black should be careful. c6 is a move that black likes to play in this in this variation. But here, it's extremely risky. I think it's sound, but very, very dangerous. And, and the, the, the dangerous line is this. Knight takes e5, and then bishop takes e5. And then e7. Okay, so this doesn't win material because black has queen to a5 check. But... You know, white's got uh, a couple of pawns for the piece. The the, the black king is extremely exposed. The uh, the white rooks are going to come into play pretty quickly. So I, I would just avoid this. Even if it's sound for black, white is going to be equal. I mean, I'm sure white has perpetual check at the very least. And um, so I would prefer, instead of playing c6 back here, to just play queen to d6. So we, we protect the e5 um square enough. So there's not going to be a sacrifice there. And, and we'll, we'll still round up the e-pawn. We'll play c6 and life will be good. For instance, castles, bishop e6, knight to d4. Okay, no no bishop to g4 this time because I think if bishop takes e5 at the at least maybe maybe bishop takes, or maybe queen takes g4 is also playable. Yeah, and then you ruin the, uh, the black pawn structure. So bishop d7, takes, takes, Queen h5, aiming to uh, drop the knight on f5 now. So we want to stop that. The way to do it is with knight to g6. Now, if white plays bishop to h6, well, this is no problem. Takes, takes, and now that the queen no longer covers f5, we play c5, and we're doing just fine. Uh, and all these lines, by the way, you might be concerned. You might think that these split pawns that black has on the king side are, are a problem, but they're not... A big problem. They're, they're at, at worst, a very minor one. And the reason is that, first of all, white doesn't really have much chance of building up an attack. So the, the, the fact that they're split, if you're worried about them as a defensive liability, you really don't need to be. It's, it's with, with some accurate moves, which we've already seen, the black king side is safe. On the other hand, in the end game, they're not really too big of a problem either. The reason there is that they're not on an, on an open file, so it's not so easy for white to just kind of straightforwardly load up against them. Secondly, for defensive purposes, for, for dealing with white's majority, they're as good as, as uh, you know, connected pawns would be. 
what's important for black in terms of the pawn structure is that his majority on the queen side is clean. So there's no double pawns there. So I think black is just fine. There, there are no problems for black here. Position is equal. Okay, going back here. If instead of bishop to h6, white plays bishop to e3, well, then we do play f5. And again, white can't play knight to f5 himself. And our bishop on g7 now has a, a free diagonal. So this is perfectly okay for, for black. And so going back here, I think we can say that e6 doesn't promise white any advantage after knight e5, even in the bishop to f4 line. But again, I would recommend queen d6 and not c6. Okay, so next line. Uh, we already talked about e takes f6, just very, very briefly. I think that promises white nothing. So bishop takes c6. This would be the main line here in this complex. So b takes c6. Again, ef is nothing, but e6 is important. Okay, rook to e8. And now we've got um, a choice for white. Castles is the main line, but I'll briefly mention bishop takes e3. Or not takes, but bishop to e3, preparing queenside castling. Uh, I had a game a long time ago with, with Elliot Winslow, who's uh, an IM. Doesn't play very much now. I think he's mostly a backgammon player these days. And um, it was it was interesting. He castled queenside, and the game was in balance for, for quite a while, for about another 10 moves or so. But it was a very dangerous approach for him, and he, he missed one tactic and, and just got... Uh, his king got, got destroyed. Um, and that's the danger of this this approach for white. So he was playing for, uh, again, I don't remember the game off, off the top of my head. I could look it up. And I think I might have presented it here before. I know I, I've, did, I've uh, presented it somewhere um, once upon a time. But basically he went for a plan where he was trying to blockade on the d4 and c5 squares. And he just couldn't, he didn't quite have enough time to pull it off. And his king was in, as I said, it was in danger with accurate play, he could have maintained the balance, but one inaccuracy was all it took for his king to uh, to be in trouble. And it's not surprising because, you know, after c5 and d4, which is one of black's aims in this line, uh, the bishop on e6 gets into the action. Sometimes the bishop on g7 is in the action after f5. There's an open b file. So all kinds of ways for white to get in trouble. Anyway, continuing here, queen d6, fighting for the c5 square, queen a6. And now, black has tried various things, but I think it's a very simple approach is pretty good here with just c5. If white tries to keep the queens on with queen a5, then I think after d4, black is even a little bit better. So it's probably safest to just trade, but, but this position holds no, uh, no terrors for black either. Um, eventually, he'll play d4, most likely, and with this bishop pair and good central presence, I think the position is equal. True, uh, white or black no longer has the uh, clean majority, but it's um, actually still pretty good because, you know, with, with d4, c4, d3, he could, in principle, create a passed pawn. Um, anyway, this is, um, it's a complicated ending, but I, I think black is, is doing well. All right, and so bishop to e3 followed by castles is really not the main approach. Castle and kingside is. All right, now we take with the rook this time. Okay, here, if bishop to e3, we just play c5 and d4 with equality. So the bishop on c8 is going to be very nice on b7. Queen maybe comes to d5. Maybe just play queen to d5, and the bishop comes to f5 or g4. In any of these cases, I think black is doing quite well. So queen d3 is the main move here. And now a5. So we're threatening bishop to a6 with a, with a skewer here. Okay, and now we'll talk about three moves for, for white. Um, in blitz, I've seen bishop to f4 fairly regularly, but this is a, a mistake, actually. The idea is that on bishop to a6, white will play queen f5. And um, on something like rook to f, rook to e4, okay, it's no big deal. He just plays um, queen to d2. And another idea is that black or white has a, a little cheapo in mind, which is that if you play c5, then bishop takes c7 with the idea queen d5 check and queen a8. So that's that's the trick. So it looks like a pretty good move, but there's in fact a problem. You can play bishop to a6, and after queen f5, here's the key move, queen to c8. And this is oops time for white, because if he moves the rook from f1, then rook to e1 check picks up the queen. So black is in fact winning winning material here. If knight to d4, rook e4, and again, um, all of the white pieces are in pre except for the rook on a1. So you're attacking the queen, you're attacking the knight, 
the bishop on f4 is loose and the rook on f1 is loose as well. So this wins material for, for black. Bishop to f4 should be avoided. Okay, next line. If um, knight to d4, attacking the rook straight away. This also has a little bit of uh, trappiness to it. So rook to e4. Now white should play f3 at this point, and then this will level out to equality. Bishop to a6, queen c3, takes, 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 takes. And it's roughly equal. Black's um, pawn structure is a bit frayed, but I think you'll have a better central presence and um, a slight lead in development. So I think all told this, this should be equal. Probably black will play something like queen to d6 here. I mean, that looks like a, a pretty natural move. Um, but the trap, though, going back here, instead of f3, bishop to a6, and so on, you might wonder, well, why not just play knight takes c6? Well, here's the answer. Queen d6, knight to d4, bishop a6. Now, this is obvious, but there are some more twists and turns in this line. It's actually kind of neat. So knight to f5. All right, so now if bishop takes d3, knight takes d6, and the black rook on e4 is hanging right back. Okay, so queen to e5. So is it over now? I mean, we're threatening the queen, we've got the skewer, and we're hitting the knight. Well, not yet. Knight e7 check. Now if queen takes e7, queen d5 check, and queen takes a8. Probably the best move here is king to h8. And now, queen to d5. And here, if, if black were to trade queens and take the rook, well, white has two pawns for the exchange, so that's not so bad. All right, but we're not done making white twist yet. Rook to e8. So now we're, we, we saved the rook, of course, and we're attacking the knight yet another time. But there, there's also the point now um, that if after queen takes, rook takes, let's say, well, okay, knight c6, rook here. If knight takes a5, I mean the problem here, is that after bishop f1, king f1, white has three pawns for the exchange, but he's getting mated. So obviously knight takes a5 is bad, but there's still knight to d4, so it's still not completely clear. All right, it's about to clarify. Bishop takes, rook takes, and now finally bishop to a6. And this wins the piece because if the knight retreats, there's mate on e1. Okay, and um, white has two pawns for the piece, but... They're not great pawns, and um, the black bishops will be quite active. So probably black is winning in the long run here. Certainly black is much better. Okay, so let's go back. Back, 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 back. Okay, so instead of bishop to f4 or knight to d4, the main move is rook to e1, I suppose, but this is nothing special either. You just trade. And now a very useful little uh, shift here, c5 and then c6. So... We've still got a pawn on c6, backing up the pawn on d5, but it's nicer to have the pawn on c5, so there won't be any blockade on the dark squares in the center, and this pawn might sometimes come to c4 as well. So black is doing perfectly fine here. Okay, so that concludes our coverage, not of the Schliemann, but of the lines with queen to e2 on move 6. So now we come to knight takes f6, and this, I think, is why it's best. All right. Uh, after queen takes f6, I would say, along with d3 on move 4, so back here, d3 on move 4, and this line with knight takes f6 here, I think these are the two lines that are toughest for black, um, not in the sense that black is in trouble, but it's tough for black to, to obtain serious winning chances in either of these lines. So white has a couple of ways of, of kind of taking the air out of the ball and um, making black play for a draw. So to, you know, you have to use the Schliemann kind of judiciously. If it's an opponent that you don't mind drawing with if it comes to that, then you can play it. If it's someone that, you know, you, you feel like you have to beat, and it's someone that you think will know these lines, okay, then maybe you have to choose a different, uh, different opening variation. But if it's someone that you don't mind drawing with or you don't think they're going to play for a draw against you, then, um, you know, then it's okay. All right, so knight takes f6, queen f6, and, um, okay, here we, we have to uh, discuss another branch. So queen e2 is the main move, and I think the best move. But castles is also uh, an interesting and tricky line. Now, the main line, the uh, quote-unquote refutation of this in olden days, was knight to d4. This is a really risky variation, and I think at this point... Uh, I, I don't think I can recommend it any longer. 
and I'll I'll uh, show you why. But it's it's I think it's still sound, but I think it's a, a poor choice practically speaking. All right, well let's let's have a look at why. Knight takes d4, e takes d4. Now the old main line went like this: rook e1 check, bishop e7, and then queen e2. And this allegedly prevents um, prevents black from castling. So f of course. Um, the point is that this bishop on b5 covers f1. So if, if castle's here, queen takes e7, queen f2, king h1, and there's no queen f1 because the bishop's got it covered. All right. So that's why black throws in c6. Now if bishop to a4, which is nothing special, probably, I don't know if it's a question mark move, but it's certainly not good. Now, whoops, that's a... Uh, Humus working there. Castles is, is perfectly good because queen e7, queen f2, king h1, and we give mate in two in this elementary way. So um, queen takes e7 is, of course, a blunder. And bishop to a4 is nothing special. So bishop to d3. But now the advantage that black has gained by playing this way is that the bishop on c1 is kind of stuck. All right, so now d5 and now b3. And this threatens bishop to a3. So it looks like white is still okay, but now we can castle. This is okay, but it's um, just a draw if white wants it. So queen e7, queen f2, king h1, and now bishop to h3. This is the uh, the key. All right, if white takes, it's just an immediate perpetual. Black has nothing more than that, like this. But white can still fight with rook to g1. Okay, so now rook a to e8, and here white has to be a little bit careful. Um, the point is, okay, if he moves the queen someplace, I don't know, let's say to g5. Okay, this is just a blunder because of queen takes g1, and then rook e1, and then either rook takes and it's mate. So, simple trick. Um, if bishop to a3, then we take and play rook f7, and, and this is winning. Uh, one cute line that Brunello points out is this, bishop to g5, h6. Rook a to f1. You might want to give give this to yourself as a puzzle. Black to move and win. Okay, you just liquidate everything. Bishop takes g2 check. And after everything is exchanged, black is up two pawns. Now, they're doubled. Both, both extras are doubled, but still it's enough for black to win here. So going back to this position. Okay, we saw regular queen retreats are just blundering into forced mate. Uh, bishop to a3 is also bad. The right move is queen takes f8 check, and this maintains an interesting balance. So takes, rook f1, bishop g2, king g2, and this whole line has been known for decades, and it's it's about equal. So very unclear, very messy, kind of fun. If, if this were um, this position were forced, I'd probably be willing to try this with black on uh, more often, but. Uh, white, first of all, can again force the perpetual very early, but I think there are much more dangerous lines that we need to worry about. So going back here, okay, first of all, I should point out another interesting line instead of queen to e2 is queen to h5 check, g6, queen h6, c6, uh, bishop to f1. Okay, so this, this is kind of tricky. Um, d5 is, um, let's say, the uh, kind of traditional approach. I'm not sure that it's so fantastic, but it's it's playable. Um, Brunello, in his book, mentions king to f7 as an interesting possibility, while my own choice here has been king to d8, which I think is, it hasn't been played by, uh, it's not in the databases. I, I've played this with um, decent results, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's playable. Let's just put it that way. So I'll, I'll give a, a little bit of analysis here. So if d3, threatening bishop to g5, then the point is, that you can shuttle the king out to c7 and you just get it away from white's pieces. Uh, you can also play g5 actually. This is kind of kind of cute too. And and black should be okay here. Um, what else? Okay, and instead of d3, white can play rook takes e7. And um, this is actually pretty interesting. Just to give one line here: king e7, d3, threatening bishop to g5, king f7. Yeah. So here we don't really have time to play king to d8, of course. And king d6 is uh, a bit bit funny looking too after bishop to f4 check. So king f7 is the safer way to go. 
And now white just um, just develops. Bishop to d2, d6, rook e1. And here the threat of bishop to g5 followed by rook to e7 is only met in a satisfactory way by g5. And then this leads to an immediate perpetual. Queen h5 and queen f3, and the queen just goes back and forth between these two squares. Okay, so anyway, queen h5 check instead of the immediate queen e2 is interesting. But the line that's scary, and, and I think probably a reason not to maybe go for this, is 9b3. Okay, so there's no rush to play rook to e1 check. We don't want to help black develop if we're white here. Okay, so now, first of all, well, okay, c6, again, is kind of par for the course. Well, I can play bishop to d3. This is not bad either. But here, actually, rook to e1 check is interesting. Bishop e7, and now not queen to e2. Well, of course, the bishop's hanging, but bishop to a3. So this is the difference this time around. And you get this forced variation that goes like this, d6, queen h5 check, g6, and now queen to d5. Of course, the queen's immune, and c takes b5 is no good because white takes on d6 and smashes through. So king to d8 is forced, and now white sacrifices the piece here. This is not pleasant. Okay, black is just holding on here with rook to b8, and now this sacrifice is interesting too. Okay, here rook to e8 is absolutely forced. Uh, rook to a1 has been played a couple of times, but if I remember correctly, uh, just rook to e1 then is um, is crushing for for um, for white. Um, maybe queen takes d4. I mean, a lot of strong lines here. I mean, the black king is extremely exposed. Anyway, rook to e8 is forced, and after bishop to f4, you could take on b8 as well. Uh, white is doing quite well. I mean, black can maybe maybe be okay. I, I've, I've analyzed this some more, and um, I think black was always just holding on, but um, but white is doing pretty pretty well. I mean, at some point he'll cash in. He'll have three or four pawns for the uh, for the piece. So it's um, it's messy. Black has to be extremely accurate. White can torture black indefinitely. So you can play this. It, it's not unsound, but it's as I said, practically speaking, it's extremely risky. You really have to to know what you're doing. You have to be a patient defender, and um, it's not really the reason why we play the Schliemann anyway. So okay, play it at your own risk. So that was Castles Knight to d4. Alternatively, though, you can play Bishop to e7. And I think that this is actually quite all right for black. So here, there are a couple of ways for white to proceed. Now, let's start with queen e2. After castles, bishop takes c6. If black were to play d takes c6, this would transpose back into a line we're going to look at shortly. And it's a line that's pretty good for white. But there's an important difference, and it's that black can play queen takes c6 here. It's an option that he doesn't have in the other variation. And here it's actually quite good because we're hitting the pawn on c2. So if knight takes e5, queen c2, black is doing just fine. Thank you very much. And um, if queen takes e5, actually I should say after knight e5, queen c2, black is even better in this position. So this is um, definitely not what white should do. So queen e5, bishop f6, we got to save the piece, of course. But now there's no decent way for white to... Uh, to keep the uh, the c2 pawn protected, because if he plays queen f5, then bishop takes b2 is just winning material. So queen g3, queen c2, d4, d6, and black has no problems here. After bishop to g5, you can either go for a slightly messier position with queen takes b2, and let's say something like this, where material is even, but and white has this, this pass pawn on, on d5. But that pawn could be a, a, a liability. Black's got the bishop pair. Um, and okay, even if the bishops get traded off, the, the bishop on c8 is going to be better than white's knight. Uh, a2 is loose. Black's got a nice queenside majority. So black might be even a little bit better here. But again, it's a little bit murkier. Uh, it's a little bit murky, of, a little bit of a murky position. If you want a, a really stable, completely sound position with no, no weaknesses to worry about and no, no serious imbalances in white's favor, then you just take and play queen f5, and, and there's no real worries here. You can continue with c6 and d5, no problems for black at all. Actually, no rush to play d5, really, because 
no, we don't want to give up the e5 square to the white knight, but but certainly you know you can play c6 when when you're ready to. Okay, so going back then, this attempt by white to transpose to um, a different line with queen e2 doesn't really work. Okay, and there's also bishop takes c6. All right, again dc, and now if queen e2, well this transposes to a line that's good for black, bishop to g4. Okay, there's no knight e5 now, and after queen takes e5, you can castle queenside and it's fine, or you can castle kingside. And, and this si sort of position is known to be perfectly good for, for black. Um, the threat's to play bishop f3. So this is normal, and now, for instance, d3 takes, takes, and here it's a good idea to shift the bishop um, to d6. So it looks nice on the diagonal where it is trying to impede um, the, the white bishop from developing because the bishop takes b2 ideas, but, you know, you've got your own pawn on b7 to worry about. So best to just switch gears. Bishop to e5, rook e1, bishop to d6, f4, and now, for instance, um, just rook f6, and doubles. And this occurred in a game, Enders against uh, Nybak, in the, I think in the Bundesliga last year, and it was agreed drawn here. So this... This was just a complete non-starter for white as a winning try. Oh, sorry, drawn, drawn here after king g2. Okay, so back here. So queen e2 is no big deal after bishop to g4. All right, queen to e1 is a, a more enterprising try, so that way white can play knight takes e5, but the queen is misplaced on e1. So after castles, knight takes e5, bishop to d6. This is perfectly okay. It's, it's a slightly better version of uh, a known kind of line, um, better from black's point of view. So um, just to give a little bit of analysis here, if d4, then it's useful to uh, swap off your doubled pawn and then bring the second pawn to c5. And after queen e4, rook e8, f4, black can just cash everything out, and this is just dead equal. Okay, so that's nothing special for white with d4. Okay, if f4, then check, and bishop to d4 will equalize. So this occurred in, a, in a, an email game back in 2002. Black drew without any problem. So that game went knight f3. Oh, sorry, actually he won, but he was equal here. Queen takes f4, c3, bishop f6, d4, queen d6. And material is equal, but black's got the bishop pair. Um, yeah, I mean, the future belongs to black here. If anyone's going to end up with a better position in the long run, it'll be black. So this is uh, of no concern. Okay, rook to f3 has been, um, well, it's the computer suggestion, and black has no problem here. Bishop to e6, heading for d5. So c3 takes, takes, and now you just go to g6. And this is a very standard approach for black. We're going to see this in uh, much more detail later in a similar position. Black just sets up shop on the light squares, and, and white's not going to make any progress. For instance, rook to g3. Well, actually, this is a very easy line. Queen e4, and white can't take because of mate on the back rank. If rook e3, then queen c2. And uh, white's even going to have a difficult time kind of unraveling the queen side. So black is just fine here. Okay, finally, one other variation. If um, instead of knight takes e5, white tries d4 with the idea of bishop to g5, then black plays queen to g6. Threatening rook takes f3. And after knight takes e5, well, once again, we have queen takes c2, and black is equal. And notice that if white tries to uh, go pawn grabbing here with knight takes c6, it's going to backfire, because after b takes c6, queen e7, there's bishop to a6, and the rook can't move because of queen f2 check, followed by queen f1, and rook takes f1 mate. So, um, you know, white's going to have some compensation for the exchange, but certainly not full compensation. Okay. So with that, we're now done with all the sidelines, and now we get to the main line, and the, the line that's toughest for black to deal with, and that's the immediate queen to e2. Okay, bishop to e7, bishop takes c6, and now black has tried both of the, uh, the pawn recaptures. Okay, the queen recapture doesn't work this time because queen takes e5, queen c2, and then there's queen takes g7. Uh, maybe there's something even better than that, but, but that at least seems to be a pretty reasonable point. So, b takes c6 and d takes c6. These are the options. 
All right. Well, b takes c6 has been popular lately, but it doesn't seem to equalize. It seems like white has um, gets an advantage, uh, an edge, and an edge that he can perhaps use. Okay. Well, here both captures on e5 are actually okay. So, in the d takes c6 line, queen takes e5 is just nothing because of bishop to g4. We are, we already saw this in the uh, Ender's Nyback game. Takes takes, and black is fine. All right. After b takes c6, though, now there's no bishop to g4, so queen takes e5 makes perfectly good sense. So against this, black drops back, queen takes c7, castles. And this is actually a pretty interesting line. Uh, white's up two pawns, but black has um, has the bishop here, a lead in development, and some prospects against the white king. Okay, the main line goes like this, d3, bishop to b4 check. Uh, king f1 is actually kind of interesting. I think it's a Brunello suggestion. He doesn't analyze it any further. Uh, the point is that after c3, black has this nasty re rejoinder, queen of g6, hitting g2, and for that matter, hitting d3, none of which would be the case had white played king f1. So here, there's a correspondence game that went queen of g3, takes, knight e5, queen e4, check, king to d1, and um, here black played inaccurately, but if he played d6, rook e1, queen d5, check. And now either Brunello's suggestion of bishop to a5, or my own suggestion of d takes e5, followed by queen to d4. In both cases, black is slightly for choice. So um, black's attacking prospects are worth more than a pawn. Uh, notice, by the way, the opposite colored bishops. Opposite colored bishops can be very drawish in, a, in an endgame, but in middle games, in situations where the, where attacks are, are underway, the opposite colored bishops favor very strongly the side that's got an attack because, well, he can he can attack with that bishop, attack on the color squares that that bishop goes on, and the opposing bishop is really unable to uh, to defend, at least to to directly defend against the uh, the pressure on the other guy's um, bishop's color. So here, black can attack on the light squares, and the white bishop really can't directly combat that. All right, so let's go back a bit. Instead of queen to g3, white can play c takes b4, and this is uh, a better choice. Still, black is not in bad shape after queen g2 and regaining the piece. But I think white is still for choice here. So uh, black can play queen f7, t hitting the a pawn, and then white plays king to d2. If queen f6, well, then white does castle. And the thing is, um, I think that white has pretty decent attacking prospects here. So it's not the pawn that's so important as it is that um, white has the open g file and in, in various lines can swing his bishop to the a1 h8 diagonal. So here, for instance, ideas like bishop d2, c3 could prove useful, or in the line with queen f7, king d2, a subsequent bishop to d4 would, would perform the same function. So for this reason, I think white may be a little bit better. Okay, back to b takes c6. Instead of bc, or instead of, sorry, instead of queen takes e5, knight takes e5 is also possible. Now here, black generally castles. Uh, he could also play queen e6 immediately, but we'll look at this instead. And now rook e1, supporting the, uh, the queen so the knight can move. All right, well here, um, bishop to b7 might be interesting, although I think white's better here here too. Uh, but this was tried very recently by, by Vadim Zviagintsev, who's a very strong GM. So that he's trying it suggests that there may be something to this. Uh, White well, can try a number of things here. b3 is sensible to uh, support the knight further with bishop to b2, and of course just to develop. Um, queen g4 is an interesting move to break the pin straight away. And uh, in their game, Shimoev played uh, knight to f3. So takes, takes, bishop f6, d4, rook a to b8, rook to b1, bishop a6, hitting the rook, rook e1, rook f e8, takes, takes, bishop to e3, and white's a little bit better. So, you know, it's a, a typical kind of Schliemann ending. White's got an extra pawn, although it's the, the f2 pawn, which is very, very difficult to, uh, to turn into something really concrete. And in exchange for it, black's got the bishop pair. So, Zviagans have had to suffer for a long time, but the game was eventually drawn. So it's it's certainly playable. This is a reasonable and interesting alternative. Um, 
not not doesn't equalize, but it's it's certainly tenable for black. Okay, going back. Bishop to c5 is the most common move. And here the following is a very typical sequence. Knight f3. Okay, queens are exchanged. d6, d4, bishop to b6, <coughs> c3, supporting the d4 pawn in anticipation of bishop to g4. Okay, so now rook to e3. And, all right, I mean, white could, or black could take um, twice on f3, but those endings, you know, even though there's the doubled pawns on the f-file, still white maintains an edge there. Probably better to keep the bishops for now. But after takes, takes a knight to d4, again, white's got an edge. Um, you know, his pawns are pretty clean. Black does have the bishop here, but they don't really have any targets. I mean, white's, white's structure is pretty healthy. So, again... You know, it's uh, it's playable for black, but white's going to have all the fun here. Black's going to have all the work. Okay. Uh, and you can also consider bishop takes d4 at some point, too, going for the obstacle or bishops. But with rooks on, especially with two pairs of rooks on, that's I don't think that's a good idea. I think the, uh, the c7 pawn in particular will be fairly weak. So black is better off keeping the bishop pair, at least as long as there are rooks. If all the rooks get traded off, then heading for the obstacle or bishop ending, I think, will very likely um, give black excellent drawing chances. Okay, so let's go back to this position. And we're finally winding down here. So d takes c6. This is the main move, and certainly the classical move. Okay, again, we already talked about queen takes e5. So now let's talk about knight takes e5. Okay, here, bishop to f5. And now a very important move for white. He should castle straight away. And the reason is that bishop takes c2 now is not a very good move. It's in fact a serious error because of d3. The reason why this is important is that if, if the, the pawn on c2 were really threatened, white would have to play d3 now, but white wants to play d4. So that's the point. After castles, um, castles, white plays d4. Okay, so let me conclude with this. Bishop takes c2, d3, and the bishop's in trouble. What does he do? If bishop to a4, he's in for a nightmare. Knight f3, and white's already winning. The point is that bishop to g5 is a big, big threat. And after h6, rook to e1 prevents black from castling. And he's just going to die here. Uh, white's going to follow up with bishop to d2 and put the bishop on c3 or b4. And um, I can give some more analysis of this, but I would just say consult with your computer. You'll find that um, black is not going to come out of this alive. Okay, so castles queenside is a better try, but here too, I think white wins. Um, okay, the black's tactical point is that if queen takes c2, the knight on e5 hangs. But white just plays rook to e1. So this not only protects the knight and threatens queen takes c2, but it also threatens knight to g4, hitting the, uh, the bishop on e7. So that becomes a, an option as well. And also knight takes c6 tricks. Okay, well meanwhile, white is threatening the bishop on c2. What does black do? If he plays bishop to a4, well, another tactical problem. Queen to g4 check, and the bishop drops off. Okay, so back here, last try for black. Bishop to d6, but now queen to g4 check once again, and then bishop to g5, and white gains a decisive material advantage. Okay, so that's why, after castles, bishop takes c2 is verboten. You just can't do it. So castles, and now d4. So white got what he wanted. Okay, here, bishop to d6 is the main move, but rook a to d8 is also interesting and, and worth considering. Simply threatening the uh, pawn on d4, and after c3, the idea is to play c5. Okay, it temporarily sacrifices a second pawn, but, um, but it's okay, you'll get it back. <laughs> after d takes c5, queen e6, rook e1, bishop c5, bishop f4, and white's a bit better here. And I would say in general that if white can put the bishop on f4, he's generally in pretty good shape because it goes back to g3 and it covers the f2 pawn as well as supporting the e5 square and it gets out of the way of all the rooks. So generally speaking, white is, is pretty happy with this position. Even though black has managed to get rid of his doubled pawn, that's not really so important. What's really important is the, the pressure on the f file. Okay, um, I'll note, note by the way that bishop takes c5 actually can be played here White's still a little bit better, but not winning. So the point is that after queen to c4 check, which looks like a refutation, black has bishop to e6, 
and then rook to d5, and uh, he regains the piece. However, after knight to g4, little counter trick, rook takes c5, knight f6, rook f6, bishop b3. Again, white's up a pawn. We've got the obstacle where bishop's going, but remember, when there are both pairs of rooks on the board, the uh, the drawing potential of the uh, obstacle bishops is not really that serious just yet. So white will still have pretty decent winning chances here. So rook a to d8 is interesting, but I'm not sure that it's it's best. It, it is worth exploring some. But bishop to d6 is the standard, and the, the idea is to trade off this bishop for the knight on e5 at the, at the right moment and try to create a kind of light squared fortress. Okay, well, let's take a look at one, one such example. So let's say f4. Generally speaking, when white plays f4, that's the moment to make the exchange on e5. So bishop takes e5, d takes e5, queen g6. Um, if f takes e5, that's not really any big deal either. It's, it's easier to blockade there because white only has the one passed pawn. With d takes e5, well, it's still just one passed pawn, but it's a four on two majority on the king side. So this is the more dangerous way for white to play most of the time with d takes e5. Okay, queen g6, rook f2, protecting the pawn, because if c3, there's bishop to d3. So rook f2, rook a to d8, and the typical idea here, okay, bishop to e3, rook d5, black is going to double on the, on the d file, keep the queen and the bishop on this h7, b1 diagonal, probably play h5 to, um, to make g4 tougher, to take some squares away over there, play a6 just as a matter of need, so we don't have to worry about bishop takes a7 later, and, um, and you just sit, and you hold. Um, the game that I've, th this position is from, is from a game Oral against uh, Yonkman, played in part of Biche in 1996, and I think other games have reached this position as well. Um, I've had some very similar positions, uh, for instance, against Strapunsky. We had a, a game 30, and also I think a, a couple of blitz games like this, and I managed to hold every time, I had to work, I had to suffer, but I did did hold, and um, it, it can be done. So let me continue with this um, oral against a Yonkman game a bit. So rook c1, rook f to d1, rook f to f1, h5, and a6. So we see all of the standard moves there. And now he just sits and waits. Okay, rooks get traded off. That makes black happy. Okay, and you just do nothing, but you, you do nothing well. So whites, you know, can, can bother black indefinitely, but black has this great grip on the light squares. The, the white kingside majority is not really going anywhere fast, certainly while the queens are on. I mean, if you play something like g4, then queen to e4, and you got to worry about queen h1 check, and black starts to go exploring over there. Uh, well, okay, you play h takes g4 first, but anyway, you get the point. It um, can be kind of dangerous. Okay. What does white do? And now even a little bit more activity for black here. Okay, and then finally white jettisoned the pawn to give his bishop this good square, but he still didn't make any progress. Okay, so he got his extra pawn back, but where's he going? And so now that all the rooks are off the board, now you can head for the uh, the straight bishop. Uh, opposite color ending, trade the queens off, and this is just trivial. Okay, so white continue to try, so we just put this pawn on a light square again, park the king on a square that prevents f5, and here prevents king to g5. Okay, so white's gotten the most he's going to get out of this, but, but that's it. Okay, when this happens, you always play king f7, because you don't want to allow f5 check and then g5, 6, 7, so this is important. So that way on f5, you take, and then you play f4. And this, in fact, is what happens. Key move, f4. So again, we don't allow the bishop, the, the pawn to get to g6. Because once that happens, then the black king has to go passive, then the white king is going to go to g5 to f6 and run over to the queen side. Um, you might want to check out the, um, the uh, Topalov Anand game from the World Championship match back in 2010. The uh, obstacle bishop ending that that Anon blew, so it was a draw, but you know he had to keep being vigilant, and finally he he forgot something, and um, and lost. So if you have that game, if you have that annotated somewhere, I, I annotated it on, on my blog. Um, 
back of the times, you can look it up there. My blog, for those of you who don't know, is um, thechessmind.net. Uh, but lots of places. I mean, you, you know, new in chess and you know, chess life. Lots of places will have it. But that'll show you that idea where the the pawn goes. The the, the outside pass pawn is used to tie the enemy king down, and then the strong side's king runs over to the opposite side of the board and um, and wins. So that's why f4 is really important. So we prevent g6 and we keep um, the the black king gets to stay always to the queen side rel relative you know is more on the queen side than 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 uh, white's king so takes bishop to g6 in fact the king is going nowhere now but okay he can always run back around and yeah once he starts trying to head for the king for the uh, queen side the the black king is always there to shoulder him off so he goes to f4 we play king d5 nothing doing so here finally the draw was agreed so I showed this full game because this is exactly the kind of ending that black is going to have to, to, to play in this variation. Okay, so back here. That was with f4, bishop e5, and so on. And I, again, I mentioned when, when f4 happens, that's usually the right time to play bishop takes e5. Okay, c3. And now white's idea is to play bishop f4 and then bishop to g3. So he couldn't play it here because of bishop takes c2. So there was that little trick. But now there's, that trick isn't, isn't around, so bishop f4, bishop g3, as I mentioned, is very good. It gets out of the way of the rooks, covers f2, covers e5. So now bishop to e6. Okay, now white plays f4. And again, we follow the recipe. Bishop takes e5. Uh, you could play rook a to e8. This was played by, by Rajabov against Kramnik, so it can't be all bad, and he, and he drew the game. But bishop takes e5... Um, is the more common approach. Okay, so after rook a to e8, bishop e3, queen f5, b3, a5, and a4. Okay, so this is a little bit different, but we still see some similarities here. This pawn is on uh, h5, so he just sits here. And finally, he makes the exchange. He plays queen g6. And uh, the point is that, well, what, what's white to do? He can't play f5 because of the pin. Black will just take on, on f5. And if g5, well, then the, the blockade is just airtight. So Kramnik just gave up the pawn with rook f2. Rajabov regained it and, and helped without, well, without too much difficulty, though Kramnik made him, made him work a bit. So this, this was another, the game goes another 44 moves. You can look it up on your own. Uh, this is from the uh, Amber Tournament in 2007 in uh, Monte Carlo. Okay, so that was rook a to e8. So we'll stick with the main recipe, though. Bishop takes e5. Now, if d takes e5, again, as I said, this isn't as dangerous for black because... Oh, I'm sorry. No, th this often is more dangerous because of the 4 on 2 majority. But, um, okay, we already know what to do about this. Queen g6, rook a to d8, and so on. So you just put the rooks on the d file. You keep control over all these light squares. You know, play h5, a6, and, um, and you wait. Okay, if f takes e5... In this position, we just swap everything off on the f file, play rook f8 check, and here, okay, if white plays king to e1, then black is 100% okay with bishop to c4, followed by rook to f1 check. So white doesn't even have a microscopic edge. I mean, this is just dead. Um, so king to g1. Okay, and here, uh, this was a variation from Evgeny Postny, and he says that black's chances for a draw are higher than white's chances to win. I would certainly agree with that. Brunello, um, citing this line, goes even further, and he thinks that uh, white has almost no winning chances, and black should basically have no trouble securing the half point, or little trouble. And um, I would certainly concur. I would also add, though, that, of course, black has no chances whatsoever of gaining the full point unless white is just extremely weak or blunders horribly. So that's the drawback of this. You know, it's um, once you kind of know what you're doing, it's not so hard to draw this ending with black, but you're not going to beat anybody with black either. And, you know, I would say you shouldn't expect to beat someone even 200 points lower rated than you in, in this, this variation. Uh, maybe even 300 points lower. So it's, it's, it's pretty tough. Um, in a rapid game, yeah, I mean, not even a rapid game. There's just no way to win this, I mean, once you get to this kind of position. So, again, if you're willing to draw or you think that the, the chances that your opponent goes for this are fairly low, then by all means play it. If it's um, if it's a guy that you've got to beat and you think they'll know this, then 
again, you should probably try something else. But theoretically speaking, I think black is okay. So a couple of lines, the main line in the D3 system on move four, and this position here, white um, can play without any risk whatsoever. Um, you know, very limited winning chances, but but no risk. So if you're playing a, a higher rated player, by all means, you know, go for go for these variations. Um, you know, you can just torture the guy. If the guy draws, well, fine. You drew with a higher rated player, and um, and you you have some some winning chances. All right. Well, that's all I have to say about the Schliemann. I'm sure that it was more than enough for for many of you, but um, I think this this will give you a, a great ability to play this. You know, against anybody, um, really, from from here on out, if you want to. Um, Conversely, you know what the best tries are if you're playing the white side of this, so there's no no big advantage to be had, but but certainly ways where you can you can uh, try slowly but surely, and, and some sharper tries too, where you can you can put your opponent to the test and, and see what he knows. And I also think that I've um, I also hope that I've uh, been able to help by by giving you some independent analysis that's not in the books um, at all, and some some um, I think interesting suggestions. Okay, well, I do hope you guys try this. Um, uh, an acquaintance of mine who's a former student wrote to me uh, saying, you know, kind of uh, jokingly cursing my powers of persuasion. He, he said that um, in like the, the five years prior to uh, these shows, he had seen the Schliemann all of one time, whereas all of a sudden he had seen it like five five times or more. So if, if you guys are taking this up on my account, um, you know, hats off to you. Uh, you know, let me know. Even if it's just in uh, private messages on on uh, on the server, so to kind of give me some encouragement here that uh, this is this is being influential in a in a kind of good and mischievous way. All right, so this concludes our coverage of the Schliemann or the Yanish. Uh, next time we'll do the uh, the Berlin, and then we'll finally get to A6 lines. Uh, I think I'm going to take a week off from from the Rui Lopez though. I think next week will probably be a viewer game show. Um, or viewer questions, maybe both combined. So if you've got something pressing there, maybe throw that in. You know, don't overwhelm me with with the uh, the viewer game and uh, questions. But you know, if you've got one or two in there, or you know, all of you put together, you got a couple couple more, then then that's fine. All right. So this time for sure, I'll call it a call it a show. Take care. See you next time. Bye bye.